Well, welcome. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. My name is Jonathan Phillips and I'm the chair of the Alumni Association and it's great to see so many faces here on the Zoom call and I, I really look forward to a truly engaging conversation. I'm delighted to be joined today by our Vice Chancellor and President Professor Hugh Brady. Uh, Hugh, you're in one of the windows close by me, nice to see you. Also joined by Julia Koch, who is the Union Affairs Officer with the Bristol Students' Union, and of course Tony Henderson, who is Assistant Director for Engagement with the Darrow team. Thank you, all three of you, for joining today on this panel. Really look forward to an engaging conversation. We wanted today to be an opportunity to hear from um, key members, I suppose, about the current challenges that the university and the wider community are facing as a result of the pandemic, and a little bit more about the approach that we're taking to tackle those obstacles ahead. Inevitably, COVID has brought opportunities to challenge the status quo, and also, therefore, to do something differently. So I also hope we'll get an opportunity to explore that in a little bit more depth. As ever, it'll also be a chance to find out what's on your mind. So thank you for those who've joined and submitted questions early. And I just want to uh, invite you to take a look at the Q&A and take an opportunity there to pose any questions you may have. And we'll do our very best to bring those into conversation or indeed to answer them later in the session. So with that, um, a little bit of housekeeping. As I said, do use the Q&A panel on the bottom of your screen to submit any questions that you may have, and we'll work through that as we go. Today's session is being recorded, and you will receive an email link to the recording in the coming days after that. Should you have any technical issues, and I realize the irony of talking about those technical issues whilst being on the call, but should you ever, uh, do try starting Zoom once again and rejoining. If that doesn't help you and you continue to experience some problems, please email the alumni events team and that's alumni-events at bristol.ac.uk and a member of the team will do their absolute best to assist you, I promise. With that, no further ado, I'd like to welcome our Vice Chancellor and President, Professor Hugh Brady, and to ask you, Hugh, if we can, with a few questions. And I think the first one that's um, prevalent to everyone's thinking right now is about the student experience. So if I could ask, what is the current student experience like at Bristol during this pandemic? Thanks, Jonathan, and, and good evening, everybody. It's great to have you on the call. Um, I mean, this has been really difficult for everybody, hasn't it, for our entire society um, and, and very, very challenging for the university and the university sector. And of course, really difficult and challenging for our students, many of whom, particularly the first years uh, specifically, had such a difficult end to their secondary school career. H having said all of that, um, the, the response of our entire uh, university community um, has been really inspiring. And that, that effort started um, in Easter, uh, or just, just around Easter, um, with, with the lockdown. And it's interesting to reflect, if, if that had happened 10 years ago, we would have had to close, essentially, and students wouldn't have been able to progress or indeed graduate. Um, but if anything, um, what happened was that the lockdown, I suppose, de-risked digital innovation. There, there was no choice. So we, we were fast forwarded, you know, five to 10 years and we got on with it. Um, uh, put the entire curriculum online, um, wasn't perfect, but it was of sufficient quality to allow uh, students, certainly at the end of the last academic year, to progress and indeed to graduate for the final years. Then what followed was a huge amount of effort again uh, during the summer um, and again involving the entire community, students and staff working together. And, and you'll hear from Julio from the Students' Union, who were just being fantastic partners. And that was to prepare what we're calling a blended learning offering, a blended learning curriculum for our students. So a combination of online and face to face. Um, so for example, I mean, it just would not have been safe to offer the traditional large lectures. Um, so, so that material going, going online, some of it so-called synchronous, so live online, and some of it asynchronous, you know, um, where the students can take it at a time that suits them. But at the, by the same token, students uh, stressed to us during the summer that, that some face-to-face, -face, not just in the lab subjects and the clinical subjects was really important. So a huge amount of effort to make our 
halls of residence, our uh, laboratories, our seminar rooms, so-called COVID secure. So if you went into the buildings, they would be unrecognizable um, in terms of uh, the, the signage, the social distancing markers, the, the, the sanitizers, the perspex. Um, difficult for students and staff having to wear face coverings. So, so it's, um, I'd say the, the, real, the real word is, is different. Um, we, we think that we can provide students the same learning outcomes, and that's the whole focus, because we've said to students, look, there's no guarantee when this is going to go away. So you're better, and there's no option, you know, to take a, uh, a gap year abroad or to travel. Uh, so, you know, why not, uh, you know, our advice to you is work with us and, and we'll get you through this year. It, it will be different. It will be challenging. But if we can get you the learning outcomes, we can get you to that degree and then we can get you to those career opportunities. In, in parallel, of course, or hand in glove with that, um, huge amount of work in the halls of residence to handle. Uh, we, like, like so many other universities, had, had outbreaks that had to be handled. Really difficult for students who are self-quarantining. Thankfully, our cases are now down to, you know, in, in the one or two hands, that type of, uh, uh, in terms of new cases. Um, so coming through that period, and now the focus is on, you know, refining kind of that blended learning offering for this second term. Uh, so, you know, again, pivoting, pivoting our focus. Um, so really a, a year dominated by uh, uncertainty, by digital transformation, by partnership, and just by a collective putting the shoulder to the, wheel, to the wheel in a way that probably hasn't happened for 50 years plus. So it's it's obviously been a, an amazing effort, and you'd speak there of partnership, which I think is a fascinating word to use. Partnership amongst staff, amongst students, amongst the students' union, a collective effort to make it as rich uh, an experience as you possibly can. So yeah, congratulations to all those involved. I know the work has not ended, but it's been a, a, an amazing effort. Just picking up on one of the themes there, and you know we recognise the importance of universities in solving some of the challenges that this pandemic has brought about. I wanted to ask, how has Bristol, in your view, contributed to both the, the global and the local civic community during this crisis? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Jonathan, because, of course, our university was born out of the, the, the community. It's a civic university uh, since its origins. Um, so our, our local and regional civic response has been really important. And at the same time, we pride ourselves in being a internationally competitive research intensive. So maybe a few words on, on each of those. Um, the civic mission uh, and the civic activities, I'd say, have been multi-pronged, varied, very impactful. And again, I, I've used the word before, but actually, certainly for me as VC, inspiring. So just to give you a few examples. Um, we had our first um, online graduation you know, at the end of, of uh, the last term when we graduated approximately 200 new doctors. Um, and over 80% of those immediately joined the NHS early. So right there on the front line. So that was fantastic to see. Um, students, we have a fantastic tradition of volunteering, as you know, at Bristol. Um, but again, the numbers of students volunteering across our city um, and particularly focusing their activities on caring for those vulnerable citizens and communities in our city, again, just was fantastic to see and, and really appreciated by, by the leaders and the citizens of the city. Um, a third example, um, colleagues in, in, in the School of Chemistry, but actually drawn from across the university, um, literally converting their labs into a high production machine to produce thousands of liters of hand sanitizer that we use, but also made available to, to schools and other institutions, you know, care homes across the city. And then finally, our, we have this, um, this wonderful expertise in public health and epidemiology and modeling within the university. Two of our staff, our colleagues are involved with National SAGE and part of that modeling. Uh, you'll, have, you'll have seen them actually probably on Radio 4 and other, uh, other outlets. Um, but we also have a, a, a huge numbers of staff involved in, again, working, going back to that partnership with the city, modeling the outbreaks, not just within our community, but within the city and advising the city on interventions. So, so there are just some examples of, of, of the civic. Um, when it comes to the global, um, again, it, was, it has been um, just um, 
amazing to see how quickly our research community pivoted their research across the university to COVID related research. In, in, in the biomedical and life sciences particularly, uh, you had within weeks this self-forming group called the Uncover Group, which is, I'll get the acronym wrong, I'm sure, Jonathan, but it's the, it's the University COVID uh, Emergency Response Group, essentially. Uh, about 150 researchers um, from, from across the community. Now, what was important was, since 2002, we've had one of the only level three, so, um, you know, uh, high containment uh, facilities approved for studying coronaviruses. So, so that group, of course, it wasn't um, SARS-CoV-2, they've been studying, it was different types of coronaviruses. But within weeks, they, they moved their research to studying the biology and the pathobiology of SARS-CoV-2. They immediately linked up with our synthetic biology. So these are kind of biochemists who work, use engineering principles to study biology. Um, they have just made some just amazing breakthroughs in the world's top journal uh, science over the last few weeks, identifying how the uh, spike protein docks with human epithelial cells in the lung particularly, and even more importantly, identify the little pocket that if you have the right compound in it, it causes the docking, it causes the de-docking maneuver. So you can, you, can, you can be guaranteed that all of the uh, pharma industry across the world were, were pouring over that paper um, once it came out. We have um, some of the UK's experts in, in vaccine design. So we have our own vaccine design that's been trialed in the UK and Vietnam. Um, and we have, uh, many of you will have seen Adam Finn, Professor Adam Finn, who's one of the UK's top vaccinologists. Um, so he has been, and our city has been one of the lead recruiters for the Oxford vaccine. And of course, we're all just anxiously waiting for that. But I mentioned it's, just, it's not just in the, um, in the life sciences and health sciences. We, we have um, one of the UK's only uh, um, centers for doctoral training in aerosol science in our school of chemistry. They never anticipated they would be studying viruses in aerosols. But now, for example, they provided some of the key data on what is safe and what is not safe in terms of distancing and face coverings. And a really important and fascinating uh, study happening at the moment where they're actually studying the ability of the virus to live suspended in air. So they're literally at this containment lab using uh, uh, probably electromagnetic fields, I, I, I'm sure I have that wrong, to study how long that virus can, can, can survive suspended in, in air. So again, we're really looking forward to that. Uh, and then two other examples, just very briefly, um, uh, uh, colleagues in social sciences looking at the impact of the, uh, the pandemic on domestic violence. So, you know, the dark side, unfortunately, are one of the other uh, dark sides of, of this pandemic. And then unseen, but really important, um, one of the uh, uh, really emerging expertise of our university is in cybersecurity. Uh, so we have colleagues in science and engineering, particularly working very closely um, with uh, GCHQ as an example, with um, utilities uh, industry, uh, protecting our NHS, protecting vital uh, you know, facilities and utilities during, during this COVID. And as you know, probably, I think there's been a 30% increase at least in, in cyber attacks during this. So a, a multi-pronged, a really impactful, uh, a fantastic response that has involved our entire community. And so many of these individu individuals are the same individuals who are affecting that wonderful digital transformation in terms of our teaching and learning. So, so again, as, as VC, it's just, uh, it's just for wonderful for me to watch. And of course, we're trying to support those individuals as best we can. And really a big thank you to our alumni because many of the projects that I've been, off, I've been describing um, have been funded by alumni, as, as have really important scholarships and contributions to the hardship funds uh, for our students. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't have put this effort together without the support, uh, wise counsel, um, um, and, and uh, uh, of our alumni across the globe. Thank you, Hugh. That, that is a, an amazing answer. And again, I, I can use the word uh, aptly. I think whenever I hear the work that's being done inside the university, it, it humbles me to hear the contributions that Bristol and the university are making to the, this wider global effort. 
you, you touched on one area that I'd like to explore in a little bit more depth, which is outside of the, the pure science impact that Bristol is, is absolutely uh, having, but more on the social side. So I'm just interested in how uh, Bristol is working towards, you know, highlighting the social impacts of the pandemic and doing what we can to improve the, uh, how best to put this, I suppose, the, the social prosperity post COVID. Yeah, so, um... So actually, first during COVID, I mentioned I mentioned our colleagues who were on national sage on the. So for those of you who might be watching from outside of the UK, this is the scientific advisory group for emergencies that advises the UK government on its COVID response. And one of our key contributors there is Professor Lucy Yardley, who's a, a behavioural psychologist, um, because. The science is one thing, or at least in, in terms of the life and physical sciences, but how we behave, how we respond, how we can be encouraged uh, to, to be better citizens, given that so many of the, um, of the interventions that really make a difference are, are actually behavior and, uh, behavioral and quite simple. Um, I, I mentioned that, uh, that group um, studying um, the uh, really, really um, tragic but important area of domestic abuse and making important contributions there. We have a, a newly established uh, economic observatory um, run by a new, new hire, Professor Richard Davies, advising the government on, on policies you know, that are relevant to the COVID response, uh, economic recovery uh, specifically. And then I think that we have uh, just the final um, area that I'd highlight is we're now, I suppose, looking forward a little bit, you know, having, having learned how to deal with the emergency and the urgent uh, situation, looking at how our various disciplines can contribute, particularly in the context of the city region, to economic recovery. And many of the areas that I mentioned earlier, um, digital resilience, 5G, AI, robotics, cybersecurity, digital health, real strengths of the university that the government recognize and rightfully so as being necessary for upskilling of the population during during recovery but also to give our industries in the city region and wider across the uk a competitive edge post covid post brexit you know in a really competitive world um, our new campus in temple quarter gives us a, a really interesting um, um i suppose new palette actually to play with um, real momentum to what's been called the Western Gateway, which is how do um, the, the universities and industries and other innovation assets in the West of England and South Wales work together again to create um, a, an innovation ecosystem that can compete not just in the UK, because, because I certainly um, like to think that the, inter, the, the competition is international. How do we compete with Boston, Berlin, you know, Bangalore, Beijing? Um, and, um, and I'd just say we're up for that challenge. I, I, think, I think our staff really feel there's an obligation given the expertise and the assets we have to be part of that conversation, to be a part of that effort. And we're, we're, we're determined to do so. Fantastic. And, and thank you so much for those responses, Hugh. I know we'll, we'll come back and ask a, a few more questions as we progress through. Um, you know, whenever I host or I attend these briefing sessions, I'm always struck by the amazing impact that our university has on the city, the country, and of course, globally. It is genuinely somewhat humbling. So thank you once again for the oversight of those, those three areas for us. I wanted to take a, a brief moment, if I could, to also reflect on the amazing contributions that our alumni make to the alumni community itself. You know, we are, we're a volunteer network and ultimately while 2020 has been a, a highly unusual year, quote unquote, it remains true that our association would be nothing without its volunteers. So today I'm really honoured to recognise two such volunteers who are joining us today and conferring to both uh, the Alumni Association Medal and that's to Charles Gunter and also to Julian Metcalf. I know, gentlemen, you are both with us, so thank you so much for joining. I'm delighted that the commitment, dedication and time that you have both given to benefit the alumni community has been recognised uh, in this way. The Alumni Association Committee and I'm sure the University are incredibly grateful for your contribution and the services to the Alumni Association. So thank you both and we're delighted that you're able to join us today. Sorry too, of course, uh, that we're unable to celebrate your achievements together in person, 
but I have every hope, as we all do, that that moment will ultimately come. So thank you once again, Charles. Thank you, Julian. I'd like to turn to, to Tony. Tony, thank you so much for joining us today. Tony Henderson, Associate, uh, sorry, Assistant Director for Engagement. My question here, considering the challenges that the Vice Chancellor has already spoken to, how can alumni come together to support each other and the wider university community? Thanks, John. And um, yeah, th and I also re want to reiterate that huge congratulations to um, Charles and, and to Julian, because um, it is the contribution of the alumni community to support each other, which is um, so fundamental. And, and we've seen so much during these times as well. But um, talking to the challenges that the Vice Chancellor went talk through, despite these challenges, um, it has been incredibly heartening to see um, how much this, the alumni community has come together to support um, not only each other, but also um, that community of, of students and staff as well. So if I may, I'll, I'll just run through the different areas that alumni have been supporting that, that wider community. So if we look at the support that they've been giving to students, um, we started off um, with, with lockdown number one, um, where we launched in response to that, um, a Bristol Voices programme, and that was very much in response to isolation that students from um, care leaver backgrounds, estranged from their families, uh, international students that may not have been able to return home, there was a real sense of isolation. And um, the Bristol Voices programme was, was launched in response to that to link those students up with alumni to give social support. Now that's very much in addition to um, the dedicated wellbeing programmes that the university um, has on offer, but it was this much more social support that the alumni could support there. And we're looking to do the same over the Christmas period and, and seeing again, how we can support that student community that may, may not be able to uh, reach, reach out to others or, or return home as they may would have wanted. So, um, but, but that's been really heartening. We also have seen um, alumni get involved in many of the sort of student and social activities, which I'm so sure Julia will speak to later, but um, support for student societies and, and activities has, has been great, albeit digitally. Um, we've also seen incredible support for the employability agenda. Obviously, we are facing uh, an incredibly tough job market right now and a, and a really, really tough time for graduating students. Um, and literally, even within the last term, we've seen hundreds of alumni come forward to support that employability agenda, whether that's um, speakers in some of our employability events that we're running, um, we've uh, relaunched the, the Bristol Mentors program, reaching out to widening participation students this year, and all um, 100 mentors are now matched with their students. Um, we've had many um, alumni come and use our Bristol Connect platform, where they can literally offer sort of online support to our students as well through that platform. Um, and, um, and, and we've seen um, that support working across faculties and schools. We work in partnership with them to identify particular areas of need. We've been working with arts, who uh, the arts and entertainment industry having been impacted. We've had alumni who can offer really um, great ex personal experiences and insight as to the different opportunities that's, that students may need to consider at a time like this. So that's been um, wonderful to see as well. We've also had alumni supporting with our student recruitment efforts. So this week is um, postgraduate taught open week. Um, we've had alumni come forward to provide testimonials and also speaking to prospective students. Um, we had a lovely example earlier on in the year where alumni helps with our outreach activity for widening participation students. And that was specifically for pupils in year 12 who are interested in STEM subjects. Um, and we've also had alumni supporting the outreach to we're working alongside a charity. Um, so where black heritage uh, students have been supported with their study choices, where alumni have been offering their own experiences um, to help support with, with they, that's those students making decisions about the options that they have. Um, and finally, and, and last not least, uh, it's it's that support for each other that the alumni community have be, been giving each other. Um, we've we've obviously referenced um, Charles and the, the work that um, he's been doing recent, even last week the Wills Hall Association um, published and launched a beautiful uh, Remembrance Day film for their alumni community and, and students 
Um, we've had the London branch AGM recently held digitally and we've got Cambridge branch meeting this weekend. Um, we had a Canada group who is um, our longest standing group who have been having annual reunions for the last 18 years. And this year they came together and held a, a digital virtual reunion, which they all thoroughly enjoyed. So um, all in all, we've seen all, all of our groups, associations, networks coming together digitally and, and um, offering that, you know, support um, and, and collegiality and, and, and for each other um, during this time, which has been wonderful to see. And, and last but not least, um, it's really sort of thanking you all for joining today as well. We've been running this um, digital events program now for the last few months. Um, obviously, the, the ideal is that we will come back face to face, but I, I think what it has afforded us to do is reach um, the global alumni community. We've seen people, um, alumni from 72 different countries. We've seen literally thousands of alumni engage with this event program, um, which has been wonderful to see. And, and again, thank you so much for joining us and, and be, being an active member today as well. Fantastic, Tony, thank you very much. Julio, also thank you so much for you for joining today. I really appreciate it and uh, great to see you. Um, I'm not too old to forget that a big part of the student experience takes place away from their studies. So how are the Students' Union supporting students with that extracurricular life during this you know, really challenging time? Yes, thank you, John, for the opportunity. Hello, everyone. Um, John is right, a big part of uh, student experience is not what happens within the classroom, but what happens outside the classroom in terms of community building. So first of all, how the SU has helped student groups adapt during this tough time. We've adapted activity to run online and support and supporting student groups to do the same. A lot of additional training and resources have been produced so that groups feel comfortable to be able to run activities and events online or in-person events following guidance pre-lockdown. For example, our Salsa Society, once we opened up our rooms within the SU building, they were able to use it for practice Salsa lessons, which were obviously done uh, with the requisite safety measures in place, but were able to create that sense of community building, allowing especially first years to make friends and build a home away from home. Um, as Tony has also mentioned earlier before that in collaboration with the alumni team and the university, we were able to secure 20,000 pounds from the alumni association committee, which was help, which helped student groups that had suffered financially pre during August holidays and at the start of term to be able to be to be able to come back on their feet financially, and it was split up to 15,000 pounds was went towards creation of welcome boxes. So welcome boxes were these boxes that were created that had little mini games, maps of Bristol, games that could involve more than two people because of our students in homes were staying within uh, living bubbles or living living cycle, circles. So these welcome boxes were a way of breaking the ice and getting students to engage with themselves. And the other £6,000 was dedicated to supporting student groups that had either lost um, a financial stream than because they were either supposed to have a ball during the summer or they were going to have an overseas trip with their team. So we were able to use the £6,000 from the Alumni Association in order to cushion them from the financial hardship they might have experienced during this time. Despite this current um, uh, pandemic, we've still been able to run a number of our usual programs that used to go ahead uh, year in, year out. Say, for example, the Black History Month that happened in October, uh, the I Am um, um, campaign project, which is raising Islamophobia awareness among our students, Reclaim, which is run by our Women's Network, which involves running a series of events around the theme of women empowerment, and our Interfaith Week, which is a series of events where we allow students from different religions to understand and talk to other students who have different religions from them in order to build this sense of diversity and understanding within our student body. 
intramural, which is our more relaxed sporting activities. If you, if our students did not want to get in, heavily involved with our sporting activities within the university, as we do understand this can be a lot of time constraint, especially to those students who have demanding degrees, not saying that the other degrees are not demanding, but have more contact hours than others. We have introduced the intramural aspect, which allows students to interact and uh, play sports in a leisure way once a week. And this allowed students to meet other people and take part in physical in-person exercise uh, despite being in COVID. Uh, in the spirit of well-being and mental health, our student groups participated in the Movember campaign, managing to raise over 30,000 uh, pounds that will go towards raising awareness of men's health and suicide prevention. Some fun stats from this uh, Movember campaign, uh, 28 teams with 382 members took part, a total of 1,400 kilometers was covered by our members. And the team that has raised the most is my personal favorite. And my club, UBRFC, uh, our university rugby team, raising over 7,000 pounds alone. And finally, an ultra marathon from Bristol to Cardiff by our student members featured during this time. Uh, during the second lockdown, which I know most of you are worried about, one big issue that our clubs and society struggled with was membership engagement and membership retention. A few of the innovative ways our clubs and societies have overcome, have overcome this is, for example, our women's rugby paired up and decided to do a cycle from Bristol to Bath to keep active and fit and enable freshers to still make friends during this unprecedented time. Additionally, our East African society, I'm being a bit biased here because I'm from East Africa myself, Kenya, held the collaboration of this academic year so far. A total of 17 different East African societies in the UK, and not only in the UK, but in America as well, participated in the virtual games night on the 6th of November, 2020, making it the biggest event East African society collaboration or any society within the SU has ever held before. Turnout was at its peak for the 100 plus attendees. Some societies included Manchester, Leeds, Nottingham, and the University of Texas in Arlington. Bristol was part of the organizing team and it built a lot of community at home away from home aspect, especially considering these are international students, some of them freshers who've never been able to leave them home up to now. So this was a good way of breaking the ice and welcoming into the uh, Bristol Loving family. Um, additionally, uh, the collaboration was brought about by the desire to strengthen the connections between East African societies across the country. Our takeaway from this is as much as our movements have been limited due to the COVID-19 pandemic, that does not necessarily mean that the aspect of community building and the student experience outside the academia cannot be realized. Yeah, and that's all from me, Don. Thank you, Julio. And, I, and I'm sure it comes as a, a relief to many of us, in fact, who fondly remember our time at Bristol, that uh, the student experience is as rich and as varied as it possibly can be in this time, and that people will come away with the same fond memories of Bristol that, that we all have. So thank you very much for, for your efforts. Um, Professor Brady, I'd love to, to turn back to you if I can. Um, and bringing us right up to speed, following the, the recent government announcements, uh, I just wondered how the students will return home safely at Christmas, if indeed that's their wish. What's the university plan? Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. And just first before I do that, can I also offer my congratulations to Charles and Julian? I am a very worthy recipients. Uh, I haven't seen Julian in a while. I did meet Charles walking down Royal Fort Drive about two weeks ago. <laughs> so uh, it was great to see him. Um, uh, in, an, in the non-digital uh, uh, format. Um, so um, yeah, Christmas. Um, so uh, government have been criticized, you know, a, a lot obviously for their handling and, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, because we're all trying to kind of almost, you know, we've never done this before. So, right. so, uh, so I think on this one, the, they, to, to their credit, they've worked really closely with the universities uh, to come up with a plan that I think makes sense. Um, so, so what they've asked us to do, um, so we've appealed to them first to say, look, whether we like it or not, the, the, our whole society has mass movement during the holiday season. 
let's not demonize our students. They're no different from young people and, and people in the workforce across, across our country. Our students, of course, now are, are restricting their movements in terms of social movements as part of lockdown. So what, what the government has asked us to do is to stagger the student departure between the 3rd and the 9th of December. Uh, so literally at the time they're coming out of lockdown and you'd hope it should be a very, quite a safe time, uh, relatively speaking. Um, we're pr prioritizing so that the, the, the students who have laboratory subjects for, for laboratory practicals, for, uh, for example, our performers, performance will be prioritized towards the end of that window. There are exemptions for students on clinical placements, which is important, and we're still waiting clarity for some other groups. We are, uh, again, in partnership with Government and Public Health England, standing up a, a testing platform. So one of these um, lateral diffusion test kits, you know, the, 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 the rapid uh, test kits, um, and encouraging uh, students to, uh, to take a test, if at all possible, uh, before they go. Um, and why? Well, I think hopefully that's obvious. So because in so many cases, they'll be going to meet families, meet grandparents, and we want to make sure that, that, that they, they keep them safe during what should be a time of celebration. Uh, so it is a coordinated effort. It is a, a good, respectful and, and nuanced conversation between, between uh, the universities and, and government. And I think the plan that has been come up with is, is certainly reasonable and, and, uh, and, and fit for purpose. It doesn't eliminate risk completely, but I think what it uses the best evidence available to try and ensure that our students depart in a safe and orderly fashion. Thank you, Hugh. And, and Julio, how have the students themselves reacted to this Christmas plan? Uh, fair to say that most students have been pleased that they can return home. We have to keep in mind that I'd like to put yourselves in our international students' um, shoes who just arrived, say for example, let's take Kenya. Arrived in, uh, from Kenya in September, um, had to do the two week quarantine, mandatory quarantine. And then maybe you had three weeks of, um, to explore the city. Then you had the mandatory lockdown. So you've not really had a lot of time to actually interact and build that sense of community as it would have been done in previous years. So definitely students are more than happy that some of them would definitely be able to go back home and see their families that have been separated from during this unprecedented time. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in the mass testing and what, the, what will this mean for students. We've had a lot of questions about whether students have to travel in this time period. And we are working with the university to make sure communication to students is clear especially for international students who have to book their flights back home and not only back home, but also the return journey back into campus. So we're working with partners across the university to make sure there is activity planned over the winter break to support students who might not be able to return home during this Christmas break because not everyone will be able to go back. Fantastic, and uh, thank you once again. Um, Panel, thank you so much for all of your reflections. What I'd like to do is to switch our focus to answering some of the questions which have been coming through um, live in the feed. Thank you for that. If you've got any burning questions, now is also a great time to tap them into the Q&A and we'll do our level best to get through as many as we can in the time that allows. The first one that I wanted to pick up, and, and Hugh, this might be directed towards you, but uh, let's see how we progress is um, touching on the very important um, topic of um, mental health and how the university is supporting staff and students through this particularly difficult time. Yeah, this is, this is um, of course, pre-COVID, this, uh, this was the, the biggest public health um, issue affecting young people, not just students, but young people in society. And, and of course, there's a real worry that during COVID, the, the situation could be exacerbated. Certainly our surveys, because uh, we, do, we do both uh, take soundings from the Students' Union, but also survey our students. So far, the numbers of students reporting mental health difficulties hasn't risen significantly. So that's good news. However, this is probably a marathon and not a sprint. So, you know, so we are um, looking at this as a priority area. 
I, I think what has served as well was that um, about two and a half years ago, we were one of the first UK universities to put together a, a kind of a university-wide mental health strategy. Uh, so to look at the, the comprehensive suite of, of supports and how they're coordinated uh, across halls of residence within academic schools and faculties, uh, our counselling service, our GP service, um, and, and indeed, I suppose, making the plea to both staff and students to understand that mental health is everybody's business and stressing to students particularly that uh, one it is a sign of strength and not of weakness to seek help there should be no stigma associated with mental health this is no different from asthma or diabetes or any, any other uh, uh, and the second thing we've been saying to students and the students union have been fantastic on this is that it, peer support is often as valuable or more valuable than the formal supports that we can provide Finally, Jonathan, I would say then, of, of course, the, the real pro, the, uh, challenge for us was to put as much of the support online as was happening. So part of that was happening pre-COVID in that, um, you know, the current generation of students, uh, Julio may not like the, the expression, but our digital natives, you know, they're much more comfortable with technology, technology than we are. So for many students, actually, they were using the online platforms uh, to gain access to counselling and various other supports. But of course, we've redoubled our efforts in the, con in the context of COVID. Um, so a, you know, a, a situation that we're, we're monitoring, um, it's, um, if we do have further lockdowns, you know, I, I suspect we're definitely not out of the woods yet, but, um, but I think what we have seen is our community working together in a very focused way on this, on this particularly thorny issue. Thank you, thank you. And actually, I think one of the follow-up questions is, is valid. So if you could approach this with question two, that'd be great. It's, it's around who specifically is, is helping the staff and students with those mental challenges. So, um, so a few years ago, we, um, we changed the, uh, so students obviously still have the halls experience, but what we did was we put in um, our, what we call our residential life team. Mm -hmm. So to ensure that in all of our halls, there is a team of professionals um, rostered on a 24-7, 365 basis to, who, who are trained to identify students who run into trouble early and to support them uh, where it is appropriate to do so and in more complex cases to move them on to uh, you know, dedicated counselling or other types of supports. Um, and the other key investment that we made at that time was to put uh, what we're call, is calling student wellbeing advisors into our schools and faculties. So it's not to say that our academic staff and professional services staff in schools and faculties, you know, they realize that part of the mentoring and tutoring experience, um, you know, that they, they have some responsibility to manage or support students who run into difficulties. But I think even at that time, what they were saying, but it's the, the sheer volume and the complexity is beyond our expertise. So putting this, again, dedicated professional resource in served us well and, and is now serving us well during COVID. Uh, so those, those then work very closely and, and in a coordinated fashion with our counselling service, with our sports exercise and health service, which has a kind of a mental health strand. And then if, if alumni haven't um, uh, had an opportunity to look at it, please look at them. Um, we've, we've a fantastic um, uh, uh, professor who has put together um, the Science of Happiness program, so uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce Hood, which is is now gone into an online format, gets rave reviews. So it, it's, it helps you to understand the science behind your mental health and the evidence behind interventions that are known to work and indeed that those that don't. So it's, it's an empowering tool which both staff and students find very useful. The very last thing I would say, uh, Jonathan, and you, you chose your, wor your, your words carefully, um, this, is, this is an issue for both students and staff because staff have been working so hard, particularly during COVID, um, uh, you know, we talk about working from home, but actually, uh, it, it's, it's actually like living at work, as many of them describe it. So we have increased uh, the mental health support that we provide for our staff. Uh, and indeed, should we need to, we'll add to that over the months and years ahead. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, Julio, I know that uh, mental health is something that Students' Union have focused on a great deal, uh, not just now, but has been historically true. Uh, can you add a little to that? Is there anything else we need to cover? 
Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Um, just for the record, that mental health and well-being has always been a priority within the university and the students' union, and it's not just going to go to the top of our priority list with just because of COVID. We'd just like to clarify that it's always been on the top of our priority list. Um, some of the efforts we've done at the students' union, as uh, Hugh mentioned earlier, is that we have increased the number of peer to peer support. Like we have trained more peers in able to handle well-being and mental health support to other students, especially to new incoming students. However, um, one uh, aspect that we have changed at the Students' Union and we have realized that has had an, a more, more profound impact is that we focus on the elements that contribute to bad mental health and well-being and focus on creating that sense of community because we realize that instead of acting reactively we should start addressing issues that start from the source and the root so if we build that sense of community at the beginning from the moment they arrive there's less likely that they will have an instant instance of mental health or well-being so we're focusing on the community building aspect and making people feel more comfortable in where they are in order to better their student experience thank you julio and tony i know that you you have another perspective to add that would be great to hear yeah, really, it's it's from a personal perspective, actually, as a, as a staff member of the university, uh, it's um, it really is a, a really comprehensive offer that that uh, we we receive um, only last week, the, um, the university put on a well being festival. Um, and this was again, it had to be digital given the climate that we're in, but it was a whole week of activities. Um, and you could you could tap into um, webinars on nutrition, um, you know, yoga exercises, breathing, meditation, um, it was helped with financial planning. In a way, you name it, that there was sort of a, a really wide remit of, of activities that were completely focused on supporting um, staff with their well-being. And I think um, along with the counselling service, um, there is, you know, many places which staff can go and are encouraged to look after their own personal well-being, and I think there's a real acknowledgement that this working from home, um, it, you know, it, it, it has changed things, and 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 we are being encouraged to look after ourselves while while working from home too. Thank you, everyone. I know we've dedicated um, some good time to that, but I think it's important. And judging by the questions, it's been um, on other people's minds too. So thank you collectively for responses. We'll try and get through a few other questions and if we can panelists, we'll, we'll keep these to the, the briefer answers. But uh, one common theme has been around um, international students, overseas students, about making sure that the positive experience that um, we would all wish they have, they have. And particularly about how we might support those uh, students who uh, may have to remain in Bristol over the Christmas and New Year period. Um, Julio, if it's okay, I'd love to come to you directly. That would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm glad you asked me this question because uh, it was just yesterday or today where we, in collaboration with the university, of course, we are planning on running a series of online events throughout Christmas, engagement events. So we've already sent out um, a series of uh, a form out to our student body, whoever would want, has any product, any student led organizations, student businesses started within university would come and showcase and build this sound, uh, a virtual Christmas market. So yes, there is support that is we are planning not only with the Students' Union, but in collaboration with the university, specifically Global Lounge and the educational department in order to provide engagement, engaging um, events and uh, support throughout Christmas. So the plans are definitely underway. Um, with regards to the details of the plans, I can't really speak of them because we just had our first meeting just the other day. Julio, thank you. That's fantastic. And one final question, um, and I think this is probably best directed towards you, Hugh, if that's okay. Um, and it concerns, of course, the financial implications for the university in relation to the COVID pandemic and a particular concerns over Temple Quarter. Um, do we have any worries that that might be impacted? If so, how and, and what are we doing to manage that through? Yes, so we do. Um... I should say our, our, um, our financial fundamentals are very strong, uh, and, and that's not the, the case across the sector. Um, really importantly, our international students did arrive and arrived in great numbers, so, so that, that, that was a great relief. However, um, 
you know, during first lockdown, we did the right thing by our students and, and, and gave a rental rebate. You know, there is the possibility that that could happen again. Um, there, you know, for in terms of construction costs, um, as you'll be aware of supply chains have been disrupted, um, construction sites have been disrupted. So I think what we're doing at the moment is we're, we're um, moving, we're moving, uh, it is shovel ready, but we're moving uh, cautiously in terms of making that final decision. We're also in active discussion with government basically saying that, you know, we, we have a very significant investment as has the private sector, as has the industry, as have our alumni through philanthropy in this venture. Um, um, government support would unlock that uh, investment. And, and again, I'd like to thank, there are probably many alumni on the call who've been really helpful in opening doors to key decision makers in both Westminster and the civil service. So, um, so thank you for, for that, type, that type of support is invaluable. Thank you, Hugh. Let me close with those questions for now. We are gonna keep the Q&A open after the event. So if there are any questions which you have, please pass them through in the usual way. And I know that one of the team will do their very best to make sure that your question is responded to. So once again, my huge thanks uh, to today's panel, to Hugh, to Julio, and also to Tony. Thanks for making this a, a really engaging session and uh, a really uh, informative one too. Before we close though, I do have one final short question for each of you. Now we are in the middle, of course, of lockdown two, but you'll always find me a ridiculous optimist. So what are your reasons for being cheerful? And uh, Professor Brady here, if we can come to you first, then Julio, then Tony, that would be great. Oh, my number one, two, and three reasons, vaccine, vaccine, vaccine. So I, as, as, as some of you watching might, might be aware, I, my background is in medicine. I'm a cl clinician scientist. And I, I, I suppose I was worried when you look at the immune response to other coronaviruses, you know, whether that which causes the common cold or SARS, it tends to be very short-lived, weeks and months. So there are many of us who know a little bit about immunology and inflammation that were worried that the vaccine response may not be significant nor long lasting. So that news from the two vaccines that have come out to date and hopefully the Oxford vaccine that we've been trialing here, um, if, if, I mean, to have two is fantastic, it augurs well for others. And that, that I think should be a great, a, get, a great game changer that could possibly see us have a relatively normal 2021-22 academic year. Everything crossed on that one, <laughs> Professor Brady. Thank you, uh, Julio. Your reason to be cheerful? Yeah, I put a lot of thought into this, and <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't think of a fun one, but I think of a serious one. Um, throughout our, as much as the, the 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 current pandemic has restricted movement and interaction between people, one uh, positive aspect that we're taking from it, especially as an SU, is that we're getting engagement from students who would never normally be engaged with the students union based in, just on the fundamental basis that we're having things online that are more accessible to the students who would not normally get involved with our students union so even with regards to you know, from the university perspective in terms of education we're having more students who are engaging with the online classes while having more students who are engaging with uh, for, uh, I think it's called replay where you will have the opportunity to, to watch asynchronous or synchronous uh, recordings for your lectures. We're having more engagement on that as we used to have it prior to the pandemic. So I'm positive that now we're reaching a wider uh, student uh, engagement portfolio. And I look forward to be able to engage the whole student body and not only a majority of them. That makes me cheerful too, Julio, that's fantastic. Uh, and Tony, if I can turn to you too, what's, what's keeping you cheerful? <laughs> I think my the alumni community is keeping me cheerful. Um, it's really, as I say, it's so heartening to see um, the number of alumni um, come forward, um, lending their support, particularly, as I say, around the employability agenda, but also that support they have for each other. If you don't mind, I'm going to read a quote because I do think it's, it's lovely um, to, to recognise that it's rewarding for both um, the alumni who get involved as well as the student beneficiaries. So from, from a mentor, chuffed to be a mentor for the Bristol Alumni Mentoring Scheme, helping underrepresented student groups to learn more about and access their desired career paths. I remember wanting such support. 
and from a mentee. This is incredible. Thank you so much for pairing me with my mentor. I cannot thank the Bristol's mentor team enough. I will definitely get a lot out of this program. So I think thank you to everybody that gets engaged um, either on, you know, participating on events like this and being an active member and asking the questions through to um, volunteering your time, you'll find plenty of opportunities on the vo volunteering pages of the website um, to find what's right for you. We are continuously working across the schools and faculties to identify the areas of the support they need and um, that we can then match you up with. So um, yeah, fine, uh, just a, a thank you once again for, for, for staying connected with the university and, and for everything you do. Thank you, Tony. And um, uh, I'm gonna steal a stat that you told me um, which is that due to the digital nature of the outreach of the Alumni Association that we now are somewhat forced to be in, uh, we've managed to engage with alum from 72, 72 different countries in recent events. Uh, and I reflect on that and think that that's uh, an amazing um, representation, I suppose, of what it is to be part of the Bristol University community, but also the, the power of digital that um, uh, trying to do something similar in physical would have been very, very hard for us to do. That's all that uh, we've got time for today. I'm sorry if we didn't manage to answer your question uh, directly. We were genuinely overwhelmed with brilliant questions during and pre the event. So thank you so, so much for submitting it. At peak, we had 122 people join us, which again is absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much for your conversation, your participation, and of course your support. Thank you too, uh, to you, uh, Professor Brady. Thank you so much for joining us. To you, Julio, and of course to Tony. Uh, thank you for an engaging conversation and of course for all that you're doing uh, to keep the uh, community and the university vibrant and operating. We really appreciate that. We hope you've enjoyed this session. We hope you found it interesting. Um, we will be logging off in a few moments time, but for anyone who would like to stay and say hello to fellow alum, this uh, meeting will be kept running, I think for around 15 minutes after our closing point on the hour. And you'll be able to use the chat function at that point, and that will be in the bottom of your screens. So do engage, do connect uh, and do what's uh, we know works brilliantly well amongst alumni, so do connect. Finally, from me in closing, just to say, keep in touch. I've been overwhelmed personally with the stories and the connections that you have shared with me over the last few months. I've been delighted to be part of this digital agenda, and uh, I think it's an amazing way to stay in touch. So thank you. Do keep that up. We're delighted to hear your stories. Importantly, stay safe, stay well, and enjoy the rest of your day wherever it is that you're connecting with us today. The chat is now open. The meeting will stay open for another 15 minutes. Thank you for your attendance.